mysteries, conspiracies, and more. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the show, and thanks for hanging out today. Today is a crucial episode. If you've been paying attention to anything going on in the UFO UAP realm, last week was the congressional subcommittee hearing where the whistleblower, David Grush, along with other UFO UAP witnesses from the military, Lieutenant Ryan Graves and Commander David Fravor, gave testimony to Congress members in D.C. So I wanted to have a guest on for this episode that really knows his stuff about what's going on and who someone who has been working very closely on getting these stories out. But before I get started, make sure to subscribe or follow the Strangeology podcast on your preferred streaming platform. Or if you're watching on YouTube, Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon for notifications on when new episodes drop. This is all super helpful. It lets you know when there's a new episode available and also helps to push the show out to more people. And I also appreciate if you take the time to leave a review for the show. I really appreciate those five-star reviews out there if you're willing to leave one. And if you haven't done so yet... It would be awesome if you did. That's also super helpful with getting the show to grow and get out to more people. Well, summer has been in full swing. It's been super hot, also super rainy, and it actually looks like the coming week for temperatures, uh, it's finally starting to cool off a little bit. As I'm recording this, I actually have the windows open. I'm not running the AC, which is nice. It feels kind of like fall is on just around the corner. So I hope you're staying cool wherever you are and that temperatures are hopefully starting to come down soon. The last couple of weeks for me has been nonstop go mode with cleaning up my flooded basement, making sure nothing's been molded out, dealing with FEMA and insurance inspectors and all that stuff. But I think things will turn out okay for where I live. And a lot of people are less fortunate and are still in need of help, financial assistance, and that kind of thing. So I'm going to be leaving the link for the Vermont recovery flood in the show notes again for this episode if anyone can donate anything to help. And also, and not as great news, unfortunately, it turned out that my partner had lost her office space due to the flooding that happened in the town that her office was in. And it was pretty much a loss. And now she has to start from scratch. One of her friends put together a GoFundMe page since she basically has to rebuild everything from the ground up. So if you're able to donate a little bit of money, any little bit helps. I'll leave a link to that in the show notes as well. If you are able to help out, my family would be very appreciative of the support. And it also indirectly helps out the Strangeology podcast as well. And if you are looking to support the show directly, you can head on over to patreon.com forward slash strangeology. Becoming a member comes with benefits depending on which tier you land on. And some of these benefits include things like shout outs, ad free episodes, early access to episodes, as well as access to the members only segment of the show, Strangeology Beyond which is basically like an episode extension. Sometimes it goes on to be an entire episode in and of itself. For my research-based episodes, I usually pick a different topic that's a little bit more obscure and try to do as deep of a dive as possible on that. Or if it's a guest episode, guests, if they have the time, will hang around for an an extra 20, 30 minutes and we just kind of have a casual, loose conversation and and just have fun with it. I've had a lot of really fun conversations with guests before, so 
It's definitely something you might want to check out. There's also things like periodic exclusive merch, discounts to my Etsy shop, VIP room access on the Strangeology Discord for some behind the scenes stuff and also updates. And I would also like to welcome the newest members of the Strangeology Patreon, Scott and Larry. Welcome aboard, guys. And to all members, past, present, future, you're all amazing, and your continued support helps keep the lights on here at Strangeology HQ. So thank you all so much. And if you want to join this ever-growing community of fellow lovers and enthusiasts of the strange and unexplained, and you want to support the show and everything else I do, you can check it out at patreon.com forward slash strangeology. All right, that's enough of that. For this week's episode, I had a really eye-opening discussion on the current state of affairs all about UAPs or UFOs with Micah Hanks. I first met Micah, I think, at the very first cryptid con I went to in Lexington, Kentucky back in 2021. And he must have been making the rounds, and he stopped by my table and introduced himself. Super nice guy. And since then, I've wanted to have him on the show as he's involved with a lot of other podcasts, research, and you'll find out all about him. And the timing was a perfect storm for this with the recent revelations coming from this whistleblower, David Grush, and the testimony and congressional hearings that just happened. So I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. So sit back, relax, grab a snack, your favorite beverage, and let's just get into it. All right, folks, welcome back to this very special edition of the show. I have the privilege today to be speaking with the one and only Micah Hanks. Micah is a writer, author, podcaster, researcher, speaker, and co-founder and the creative mind behind The Debrief. And beyond this extensive resume, he's been a longtime researcher into subjects like history, science, philosophy, zoological mysteries, ancient mysteries, and the future of humanity. But we're here today because of his background as a researcher and proponent of the scientific study of UAPs or UFOs, which if you've been living under a rock recently, you probably you know this is kind of a big deal at the moment. So welcome to the show, Micah. I'm so glad to finally have you on the show today, especially now. Uh, how are you doing? How's the weather where you're at? Are you staying cool? Well, no, I mean, it's hot, as you can imagine. Uh, the, the thing is, is in my studio here, I can't run the air conditioner at the same time I'm doing the audio. So I have to try and chill things to an optimal temperature before I come in here. So things are cool for now. That may change with the current summer heat that I'm enduring here, even at this altitude where I am in the Appalachian Mountains. Gotcha. Yes, I, I do a similar thing myself. So we'll be we'll we'll be sweating by the end of this, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know you you've got limited time. Your time is precious. So let's just dive into what's been going on the past few years. The UFO world has started to get really interesting and th things seem to be on track for this slow drip of disclosure as to what the government knows about this phenomenon. And the last few months, things have been ramping up even more. It's a wild time to be alive. Can you give us a breakdown about what's been going on leading up to the congressional hearings that happened the other day? And what was your involvement involvement along with the, the debriefs involvement with this? Certainly. Yeah. In fact, uh, there's a little bit of a personal connection here because the weekend I saw you at Monster Fest up there in Ohio, that very weekend I was disappearing for periods uh, during the event. Where's Micah Hanks? And I had to be going back up to my hotel room. I was making phone calls with a couple of incredible reporters uh, who had brought to my attention the fact that they may want to try and publish a story with the debrief. And uh, there were a lot of moving parts going on. But in terms of what brought us up to that point, I had literally been standing there at your table with you at the event talking to you. This was all going on behind the scenes. And it's all really extensions of what began in 2017 with those very two reporters, Ralph Blumenthal, a 40-year veteran uh, reporter with The New York Times and a former editor there as well. 
And also Leslie Kane, who is significantly one of the reporters, I think, who has done the most in terms of really helping to legitimize the UAP topic. Uh, going on for the last couple of decades, in fact, she wrote an extraordinary book about this many years ago. UFOs, generals, pilots, and government officials go on the record. And that was really kind of this uh, this opening statement that, hey, there are a lot of officials who have had experiences with this phenomenon. This is not just something that randos out there, you know, in the woods or what have you in the desert see at night and think that they've had encounters with. This is something that seems to be a real phenomena. Some of it appears to represent a technology. Government officials who have had these experiences do not know the provenance of said technology, and uh, they are concerned about it, but there also doesn't appear to be openly a whole lot being done. Fast forward to 2017 with the publication of the article by Ralph and Leslie, along with Pentagon correspondent to the New York Times, uh, Helene Cooper. That article, of course, kind of once again reinvigorated the modern UAP debate with revelations about taxpayer funding. Uh, and part of this, of course, acquired in no small part with help from uh, Senate Majority Leader in the past, but of course, the late uh, Nevada Senator Harry Reid. They were able to obtain funding for a program that was described in the Times in 2017 as ATIP, or the Advanced uh, Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And the uh, former director of that program, as the Times reported at that time, had been Luis Elizondo, uh, who had only recently resigned uh, and had become associated with a outfit of uh, of all people spearheaded by, you know, guitarist of Blink-182, Tom DeLonge to the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences. Right. Uh, Elizondo was joined by a number of other former government officials, including Christopher Mellon uh, in that endeavor. Now, since that time, we've learned that the article, although it referred to ATIP, ATIP was actually a unclassified nickname for a defense intelligence agency program that was actually called the Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program. That's what the ATIP referred to in the New York Times actually had been. ALSAP is the program that within the DIA that taxpayer money actually went to. And there had been quite a bit of confusion about what the Times reported and then later revelations. Um, but in any case, without getting really lost in the weeds about all of that, Following the clarification about which program got the funding, who had been involved, because again, significantly, Elizondo had had no responsibilities with OSAP, and he had said that himself. But he clarified later that the ATIP that he had been the director of within the DOD had been an informal initiative that essentially just inherited all the UFO data that had been collected by OSAP. And Elizondo said, we just kept that nickname, that unclassified nickname. We carried that right over for that informal Pentagon initiative. And I can assure you there are some who try to dispute whether the initiative ever existed. After Elizondo left government, it was taken over by a gentleman who actually had known and worked alongside Elizondo while he still worked in government. But that was Jay Stratton. Uh, Stratton and Elizondo, we may come back around to this, but they issued a joint statement last night about some of the things that came out in the recent hearing. Uh, but I sat and spoke with Jay Stratton and I asked him, I said, you know, had Lou indeed worked with that ATIP program, as he says he has. Did you know him in that capacity? And Stratton said, absolutely, yes, that's who Lou was and what he did. And that initiative, of course, continued really a multi-agency interdepartmental task force drawing from a number of different areas in government. And eventually, it was formalized and given a name in 2020, and that became the UAP task force, uh, which was the direct predecessor to what we now have, the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Now, that's a DOD program. Uh, it's got an entirely different staff. It's directed by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, uh, who's got quite a storied career in intelligence and working for the Pentagon. But all of these developments are really what preceded what we saw in June. When you and I were at that event up in Ohio, I'd been talking with Kane and Blumenthal, who in subsequent articles for the New York Times beforehand and now for the debrief, they've continued to build onto this investigation, this ongoing investigation into to what extent the government's been involved in UAP studies, what information has been recovered, what information maybe is being withheld, and to what extent uh, there perhaps is evidence of something truly extraordinary in government holdings. This article is probably the most significant in terms of moving toward bringing those kinds of claims forward because it featured the testimony of David Charles Grush. Uh, he is a former intelligence official who worked with the National Geospatial and Intelligence Agency most recently, but before that, the National Reconnaissance Office. Um, and that actually, I believe, in his reserve capacity within the U.S. Air Force. But while working with the NGA, he had been a direct liaison for that agency to the UAP task force during its time in operation. And he said during that time, 
that in addition to looking into UAP, which was not something he'd been doing beforehand, it wasn't a previous interest of his, he said he was brought in based on his intelligence career and his expertise, and that confirmed to the debrief by multiple sources also during our vetting process, which again was hectically all going on that weekend up there in Ohio, but uh, behind the scenes at that point. But indeed, it was confirmed to us. We brought that individual in according to those who had worked along with him. He didn't have prior knowledge of or experience investigating UAP. And that's important because what he says he found while working in that capacity was lots of people started talking about a program. They said this program is not something that is publicly known by any stretch of the imagination, although rumors have existed for a long time. Jeff, you know this. I know this. Um, He also said that And this coming out in the hearings the other day, that there were 40 individuals that he spoke with that helped confirm the existence of this program. And that was first revealed by my publication, The Debrief. I'm the editor-in-chief, of course, a creator and co-founder of that website. Uh, And when we published those, again, by nature, extraordinary claims on June 5th, it was quite explosive. The effect, I think, has been felt around the world. But if you'd told me at that time that as soon as right here at the end of July, we'd be seeing congressional hearings featuring Mr. Grush sitting there and providing testimony under oath where he's not only saying, yes, I interviewed more than 40 people who say that they had knowledge of this program uh, and many other things which we can get into, I probably wouldn't have believed you. And this is an incredible example, I think, of citizen action at work. You know, the, uh, the investigation has yet to give us all the full context for what Grush has said and, and, and the claims that have been made in his intelligence community inspector general complaint you know, that investigation's ongoing. We've got to wait and see what the outcome of that is. But given the nature of these claims, if any of this, if any small portion of it ends up being true and accurate to the degree that Grush says that he believes it is, we're dealing with a huge story, potentially one of the biggest of all time. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, this congressional hearing about this phenomena, it's a really a, a historical moment where the government's listening in, members of, of Congress, something I'd never thought we'd see in our lifetime, at least. You know, it was always the UFO phenomena was something that was laughed at and not taken seriously by anyone uh, serving public office. Um, now, what would you say are the most crucial takeaways from these hearings? And beyond uh, Mr. David Grush, there was also uh, David Fravor, Ryan Graves were there as well. Uh, what did they um, offer to, you know, their their testimony with this whole thing? Yeah, good question. Of course, there was so much public attention put on David Grush, and rightly so. But it's also important to point out that Grush alluded to some unsettling experiences he had had. And there's been a little bit of talk about that. My interpretation there is that he was referring to reprisals that he has experienced since coming out about these things or since having learned about them. He said that there had been some in government who had placed pressure on him, maybe even some threats. And he said that he and his wife had had some unsettling experiences. We actually reported that at the debrief. And I think a lot of people have been saying, oh, he's an experiencer. He's had an encounter. I don't think that he has. In fact, I think Grush has clarified in the past that he himself is not an experiencer. But now when we look at the two Navy pilots that were also providing testimony, Uh, Commander Dave Fravor and also Ryan Graves, who now is the head of an advocacy uh, organization, Americans for Safe Aerospace. Uh, Ryan's a wonderful person. In fact, we just had an email exchange this morning, and I uh, congratulated him on the degree of eloquence that I think that he brought to the testimony. Um, And in, in Ryan's communication, he conveyed to me, he thinks that really we are getting toward a point where this conversation can really only go in one direction. I hope he's right on that point. And that's in large part thanks to the two people like him and Fravor, who I also would call whistleblowers in the sense that they came forward and they spoke publicly with the media about experiences they had while serving in active duty uh, as U.S. Navy pilots. Um, My understanding is that Graves had learned of experiences that were direct observations or experiences that members of his squadron had, whereas, as we know, Captain or rather Commander David Fravor I mean, he had actually been the commanding officer of the Black Aces and directly observed the so-called Tic Tac in 2004. Uh, He was one of multiple witnesses to that, including a pilot, actually a weapon systems officer named Chad Underwood, who also I believe now is a commander. Uh, But uh, Underwood filmed that object using the Raytheon's Aptly Targeting Pod, and that's one of the three famous Navy videos depicting UAP we're all familiar with, the so-called Tic Tac. And I personally... 
have heard every explanation for that video ranging from that it's a distant 747 to possibly a bird, possibly some sort of an instrumental failure with the Atfleer. Um, my guess is probably in, in that series of options, option D, none of the above. I think we're looking at based on the corroborative testimony from the multiple pilots who saw an object earlier in the day, the radar trace that was detected and that being the impetus for Underwood and his pilot being vectored out there. Underwood filming that object, noting the anomalous characteristics, describing the radar jamming that was occurring in real time as he actually cycled through the settings on the Atfleer and filmed that object. You know, some have continued to try and say it's something prosaic. I don't think so. I see no means of propulsion. I see nothing conventional about that object. I strongly am of the opinion that based on all of that testimony, that is probably some of the best evidence in terms of video footage that we have of UAP in existence today. And Fravor said that much during the hearing. So back to your question about the significant takeaways, Fravor, again, reiterating that point, he's saying this is probably one of the most credible and well-known UAP incidents in all of modern history. And these are the reasons that I've just outlined why. Uh, again, Graves talking about having spoken with pilots uh, and also officials with other agencies, contract employees. He gave us an uh, example of contract employees with Boeing uh, who said during an incident, I believe in 2009 at Vandenberg Air Force Base, they observed a football field sized rectangular object hovering over Vandenberg Air Force Base, along with yeah. other things by personnel there on the base of UAP that followed that. Um these were all some of the real significant takeaways that in addition, of course, to the reiteration of some of Grush's claims about potential harm to individuals from their experiences with UAP, uh, the collection of vehicles believed to be of non-human origin. Uh, one word that stood out to me probably of everything we heard was the uh, reference to biologics that he said had been acquired yes. as well, of course, seemingly in reference to bodies of pilots. Uh, Grush, again, continuing to maintain that he's careful about calling it extraterrestrial, but when asked whether he felt that the statements by Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, uh, that there's no evidence of extraterrestrial technology, if that's accurate, um, Grush basically said he does not think that's accurate. And in fact, just yesterday, that elicited a response, a statement from Dr. Kirkpatrick, who didn't seem very pleased about the way he felt his office was characterized during those hearings. But maybe the biggest takeaway to me, in addition to the bipartisan nature of this, imagine ever seeing, uh, you know, Representative Tim Burchett, Republican of Tennessee, and of course, Democrats like, uh, you know, AOC and others right. in the room together. And, and they're, you know, putting aside their political ideological differences and coming together in unity on this issue as a bipartisan matter. The only thing maybe more significant than that is the fact that those three witnesses were all sworn in speaking under oath under penalty of perjury. Of course, you know, I think that the current uh, federal law in the United States holds that they can at least put be put in jail for about five years for, you know, lying under oath. So I would have to think that those individuals speaking on Wednesday were saying things that they believed to the best of their knowledge to be true. And given the nature of some of those claims, that's in itself really extraordinary, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, now with this crash retrieval program that David Grush um, revealed that the government has in storage somewhere, and he apparently knows where the sites are, uh, mm -hmm. they have craft of non-human origin in their possession. Um, do you think this kind of confirms um, events in our past, like Roswell or even claims from Bob Lazar that he was working on a reverse engineering project at, for a UFO, his, the infamous sports model at Area 51 slash S4? Um, does this validate this stuff and stories of so many people who have come out you know, claiming that this is real. This is this is here. You know, the problem, I guess, with Rush's narrative, uh, the claims that he has made is that he says that there are, you know, hundreds of documents and that these convey things that he was told. He says he's, of course, seen some imagery as well, but that he hasn't seen any physical evidence that, you know, is is proof. We have to make the distinction between evidence and proof. People often say there's no evidence of anything anomalous with UAP. I would beg to differ. I would say, yeah, 
Look at that Tic Tac video. Look at a lot of these different things. Even look at some of the witness testimony. Anecdotal though it is, those are all evidence, but none of them by themselves constitute proof, something that we can take and look at in our hands and say, okay, well, we can't de you know deny this anymore. Now we have to acknowledge the reality. I do think you get to a point where if there's an abundance of evidence and if that abundance of evidence can be deemed credible, it strongly points you know, toward the likelihood of there being a truth a provable truth, but we haven't got that proof yet. Um, and that's, I think, the issue with Brush's claims. He doesn't say that he's seen that proof either, but he believes he's seen a whole lot of credible evidence. And a lot of this is classified information, and it's been provided now to the inspector general. So, you know, in terms of whether this validates past claims, again, those in the for instance, Bob Lazar, you mentioned, you know, he claims to have worked at a facility called S4, you know, associated with the famous Area 51. He says that he was not only knowledgeable of a wreckage retrieval kind of program, but that he worked on these retrievals on the reverse engineering, trying to understand these technologies. He claims that he saw these things. He gave a nickname to one that you mentioned, the sport model. The difference between Grush and Lazar, for instance, and for all we know, Lazar may very well be telling the truth. I, you know, I've had some doubts about it myself, and I have had some concerns about Bob not being willing to talk to certain people under certain circumstances. Um, he seems to kind of be of the mind that, well, you know, I've told my story so many times, and if people don't believe me, I can't really do anything more about that. I mean, I've I've stuck to my guns. This is what happened, and to his credit, most of Bob's story has remained consistent. I've always said that too. Uh, whether it's true or not, he's doing a very good job maintaining the facts. But with Grush, he's going out and he's saying, look, I've interviewed individuals who told me about this. I never saw this stuff myself. I have filed a formal complaint with the Intelligence Community Inspector General, right? These kinds of things, although they don't directly validate Bob Lazar, they are clearly a distinct kind of claim in the sense that right now, Grush himself, if he's found to be making any kind of false statements, could also be held criminally liable for that. He stands to gain nothing from not telling the truth. And so unlike those in the past, because I myself have heard whispers and even spoken to some individuals who have alluded that they have knowledge of things that have gone on at Area 51, ideas about government programs and things. When you work in this business like I do, you eventually will come across those kinds of claims and those who claim to possess that knowledge. Uh, Grush, very unlike anyone I can think of, is going about this in a way that puts him at a, in a, a distinct disadvantage, one where he could really be in trouble if he were lying about anything. And I don't see how a person knowing they stand not to gain, only to lose from that, would actually knowingly go into a situation like that and lie. And therefore, I'm compelled to think that Grush is probably telling the truth at very least. Even Mick West has said this. Maybe he believes what he's saying, but some of the information is inaccurate. And there are a lot of possibilities therein as well. But again, I think that that's the most significant takeaway. If any of these things are proven true, yeah, it could help substantiate some past claims. At very least, it would seem to indicate to us something that you indicated earlier there, uh, that we've already been hearing, you know, rumors about a crash wreckage retrieval, you know, program that's been going on for a long time, past acquisitions, at least going back to the 1940s. We've been hearing about that for a long time. And so I'm inclined to think that probably most of that is sort of mythology, but it could have been built onto some incidents where there were some real things that happened, some real crashes, you know, maybe even if just one happened and that was what formed the basis of this mythology, that could be in essence what this is all about. And we could learn now, finally, that that, you know, aspect of this is true. So maybe not all the old claims would be corroborated, but we certainly could find that there was more truth to some of them than many believed. Right, right. Yes. Uh, grain of truth in, in uh, a lot of different mythologies. Now, yeah. it's uh, you know interesting you mentioned Mick West, who is a well-known skeptic in, in the UFO community, of course. Uh, but since the other day when the hearings happened, I've been seeing so many people um, on social media elsewhere that are like, oh, government just confirmed aliens. Uh, no big deal. And unless they're here to help us save the planet or help pay my bills, I, I don't care. And likewise, others are saying David Grush didn't see this stuff firsthand and is only relaying secondhand accounts. So even though he was under oath, people are saying, oh, it doesn't mean that other people weren't lying or making things up uh, about what they were telling him. Like kind of like what Mick West is is uh, 
inferring that perhaps some of the information is wrong. What would you say to those who are uh, apathetic towards this or to those who are forever skeptical? Well, first of all, for those who are forever skeptical, even if you don't buy the extraordinary claims that have come out recently, courtesy of David Grush, I would still remind people that members of Congress, you know, uh, members of the House and the Senate who have been briefed on this matter, take it very seriously. Now, they, of course, are required to some extent to do that on behalf of their constituents. When we, the American people, have a problem, if we have an issue, if we have grievances and we air these, we go to our representatives. That's why we elect them. Right. And we say, look, we got a problem here. And we need you guys to investigate this for us. They, of course, are, as our representatives, required to have to do that. There could be also the interpretation that there might be some incentive in the sense that they're like, well, if our constituents are really passionate about UFOs, the more actively involved in this we are and the more active they see us involved with this, the more likely we are to get reelected. They could understand the benefit in terms of that as well. But without removing those possibilities, acknowledging them, but really seeing the bigger picture here, my interpretation is that in likelihood, those who are members of these committees, these subcommittees like the one that held the uh, hearing the other day, they probably have been shown enough credible information collected through governmental channels that compels them to think that there's a reality to some aspects of this phenomenon. And in fact, if someone thinks I'm merely speculating, I'll uh, call to attention the uh, comments made by Representative Matt Getz of Florida the other day where he's saying, listen, you know, we went down there. To, uh, I think it was uh, Eglin Air Force Base. He said that Representative Burchett from Tennessee and also Luna from Florida came with him. Uh, this was the incident that they'd been talking about where they said that they'd basically just been told by a, uh, you know, Air Force uh, colonel, I believe, just, you know, we're not going to show you all this stuff. Get said, I was there present during this incident and this showdown took place. No, Burchett and Luna weren't shown anything, but of course I was and I alone was shown a photograph and then allowed to speak to the pilot who took this photograph. And the incident that he described, which we actually subsequently reported at the debrief as well, um, had involved a, a series of four objects flying in a triangular formation during a training exercise over the Gulf of Mexico that a group of pilots observed. One of the pilots attempted to move in close to try and see these objects, and as he attempts to uh, allocate uh, his, or rather to to train his camera on the uh, one of the objects, which appeared orb-like, he did manage to get a photograph, but he said that some of his uh, sensor capabilities on board the aircraft began to fail as he neared the object, which actually is something that's commonly reported. Uh, in fact, the uh, national, um, uh, well, actually, there are a number of organizations that have looked into this, but maybe not going through them in, in uh, 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 chronological order. I'll just reference NARCAP, Ted Rowe, director of NARCAP, um, uh, National Aviation, um, oh gosh, uh, I'll have to get the acronym together here in a moment. <laughs> so many acronyms. It's hard I to remember keep track. All of them. <laughs> yeah, Ted, I'm just a huge fan of Ted Rowe and NARCAP. But anyway, so NARCAP did an entire analysis of actually a series of UAP reports involving instrumental disturbances where uh, basically pilots who were in near proximity to UAP or had had almost near collisions with them, they came close enough to the UAP that various different onboard systems were temporarily taken offline, like gyroscopes, altimeters, um, you know, other kinds of, of of technologies and avionics on board of these aircraft. Those kinds of things have have actually been logged many times in the past. And so I'm not surprised to hear a, a pilot saying, look, we got near this thing and, and our camera started malfunctioning. Chad Underwood even said when he was attempting to film the Tic Tac back in 2004 that the ATFLIR uh, was capable of locking on, but it took him a couple of tries. But he said that while he was trying to lock on, this aircraft again if it were a bird i doubt that it would be attempting to jam his radar and yet he said this thing was actively jamming the radar so a few things that we're seeing here are signature management we're also seeing low observability these sorts of things that you know have been referred to as five observables but i think more fundamentally what we're seeing are technologies that are capable of when they think that they're being observed they can use electronic countermeasures to reduce the ability for our pilots to be able to track them so coming back to what gets talked about during the hearing the other day he says that the photograph manually trained on this object as these instrumental malfunctions began to on, to occur he the pilot manages to photograph this object it was you know again an orb like thing one of four flying in this diamond formation 
And he said, this matches no human capabilities that I've seen. I, I give that as an example of one reason why I think that probably Getz and many others, Marco Rubio and others have alluded to having seen similar things. A lot of elected officials have probably observed things they can't explain, things that, you know, again, are representative of what Arrow is calling the unexplainables in their UAP data set. And for the skeptics who are, again, I think you use the term forever skeptics, those who would say, oh, you know, there's just really never anything. All we ever hear here are stories. I think what they're missing is those elected officials who are pushing for these UAP hearings and these investigations and who are drafting legislation, no less among them now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer with the amendment, which, again, the title is explosive in itself, the uh, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Disclosure Act of 2023, with the passing of this to, as a amendment to next year's NDAA, we're seeing a lot of lawmakers who appear to have been shown videos, images, or other data that's probably similar to what Getz has described seeing. This, I think, forms the basis for why they take it so seriously. And for those skeptics who say, ah, you know, there's just stories, I think that the good information, of course, that we, the public, don't have the necessary clearances to see we aren't getting briefings about that. If we, If more of us saw that, we too would probably say, okay, you know what, there is probably something here, even if you don't buy the more extraordinary claims David Grush has made. Right, right. And with members of Congress, government in general, I think back to Jimmy Carter, who claimed to have seen a UFO uh, back decades and decades ago. I don't remember the exact year, but the government's also been aware and been looking into this phenomenon for a lot longer than um, OSAP, ATIP. An arrow with Project Grudge, Project Blue Book, and then allegedly they stopped looking into the phenomenon after the late 60s. But clearly something has, you know, kept their uh, their interest over the years. Uh, you know, there's obviously reasons why something this world breaking, I guess you could call it, would need to be kept from from the public. Um, and this to get to the point of what I'm talking about is, you know, the, the amount of time that, that's gone by. And it also it seems like this phenomenon has been with humanity for a very long time. Uh, would you would you agree that this is a lot older than the 21st or the 20, 20th century even? Well, yeah. I mean, in fact, uh, this is one of the gripes I think that I have about the current state of things. I see people saying for instance, well, UFOs, that was all just kind of a space age folklore. But now, ever since 2017, they seem to be real and they're probably foreign adversary drones. Again, most people's knowledge in the current debate doesn't seem to go back much further than 2017 when it comes to these uh, objects. Uh, and furthermore, people seem inclined to think that, well, this must be some sort of a modern technology. We don't believe those earlier reports describing flying saucers and even landed crafts, sometimes even humanoid occupants. We're just interested in the little balls of light and things that Navy pilots have been seeing since, you know, at least 2014, 2015, and whatever that Tic Tac thing was back in 2004. Again, the organization that I mentioned earlier, and by the way, NARCAP, National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena. Again, among the many acronyms we have to remember, another one, of course, being New Fork, the National UFO Reporting Center, and then, of course, NICAP, a lot of them are similar, but that was the one I've been referring to, National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena for decades has been referring to these things as UAP. Again, I've also seen a lot of recent commentators trying to say that, well, the government started calling these things UAP since 2017. That's not accurate at all. I mean, even myself in an article I had written at my website in 2015, Jeff, I had said I refer to these as unidentified aerial phenomena, and I was by no means the first person to do that. Again, go back, you'll find articles much earlier than mine at the NARCAP website. Uh, and in fact, the earliest reference I have found to the words unidentified aerial phenomena Date back to the late 1940s, I think it was an FBI memorandum that that appeared in. Uh, so rather than just getting you know lost in the weeds on the uh, terms that we use for these things, the point I think I'm trying to make is that, yeah, there's been a phenomenon for a long time. And in fact, even earlier than 1947, that was another, uh, in my view, misunderstanding about modern UFOs and the phenomenon when it arrived. People for years have tried to say... After the Second World War, we dropped bombs, you know, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and um, 
Of course, you know, bombs are on a lot of people's minds with Oppenheimer in the in the in the theaters right now. But it says we enter the atomic age. Humans emerge from that. And suddenly they, the Space Brothers, took notice. And so it's no big surprise that in 1947 they start showing up all over the place. Well, but what about in 1946 over Scandinavia, the so-called ghost rockets? What about during the war itself, the so-called Foo Fighters? What about prior to that, the so-called ghost flyers that were also seen over Scandinavia? Um, there's been some talk about in Grush's claims uh, what seems to many to be an absurd assertion that there were crash wreckage retrievals dating all the way back to the 1930s in it, uh, Italy. Yes. People, like, people say this is nonsense, but... And I'm not saying, by the way, that those claims are true, but I am going to acknowledge that there were documents that came out as early as the 1990s. And according to forensic analysis that uh, Italian investigators had done, they did determine to their satisfaction the documents were real. They were actually from some of them in the 1930s, many leading up to the mid-1940s, but they seem to represent investigations by the Italian government into unidentified aerial phenomena. And they had a name like that, unconventional aerial objects or unconventional aerial vehicles, I think is what their Italian terminology would translate to. So that at least going back to the 1930s. Uh, if you go back and you look at, for instance, websites like Project 1947 run by Jan Aldrich, um, if you look at uh, the Barry Greenwood UFO archive, he, for years, did an excellent newsletter, Barry Greenwood. Uh, he's a role model of mine, and I'm happy to call him a friend and a colleague now. But uh, Barry Greenwood uh, did a newsletter back in the day, even before we had the Internet, called the UFO Historical Review. And he went back through the newsletters, okay, and the newspapers and all kinds of clippings and scientific journals and things available in libraries. And he would find reports of similar phenomena going back decades or even centuries. Uh, and now, of course, there's an effort where Aldrich and Greenwood, the two, of, uh, the two aforementioned luminaries in this field of historical research, and a few other people, uh, and I'm proud to have recently joined as the youngling on that team, but uh, this effort under uh, our good friend David Marler, the uh, New Mexico-based UFO researcher, uh, Marler is establishing what's called the National UFO Historical Records Center. Part of the effort that we're undertaking is to try and bring to public attention the deeper history of this phenomenon. Uh, and so to your point, it goes back much further than just the 1940s. In fact, it may go back to classical antiquity. Uh, last point here, I'll just uh, reference if people want to look up a, a really excellent paper that's freely available online by Richard Stuthers. He was a NASA historian, but he wrote a excellent paper uh, on UFOs in classical antiquity, where he gives some examples of possible UFO sightings dating all the way back to the classical period. So even in some of our earliest written texts, uh, we have reports of aerial phenomena that even by today's standards don't seem to match celestial phenomena, things like uh, parhelion, you know, double suns, sun dogs, comets, meteors, ball lightning, those kinds of things. I mean, we can't always rule those kinds of natural phenomena out. But it, there are at least a few instances where even in the historical record, some of those things that many just call stories, pretty darn good stories. And they do at times sound an awful lot like the kinds of things we say we're seeing today. So, yeah, it's got a much deeper history, I would say. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in my own research, uh, you know, I've come across some older stories. I think, that, I think there was a story when I was I was looking into like the Bridgewater Triangle in New England. And there was a story from like the 1700s where somebody reported they were outside one day and they saw this object like over a valley uh, and it's just like okay so this well, has been going now, on for a while <laughs> going back i think to the 1500s you know john winthrop in his uh, diaries he wrote about aerial phenomena that were seen sometimes coming up out of i think they were rising out of boston harbor these lights and he would describe them as sometimes being in the shape of a man so there was almost a spectral quality described one of the more curious accounts that Winthrop gave us was that he said that there were uh, men who were going down this river on a boat one night and that they had encountered some sort of a strange light and that suddenly they found themselves much further back up the river than where they remembered having been. So there's almost like a missing time kind of a component mm, to this yes. account that Winthrop gives uh, of a sighting of aerial phenomena. And that may be one of the earliest reports from the new colonies in America. So, yeah, once again, to your point, for those who go back and look at the history, it's it's riddled with reports of strange sightings of luminous phenomena in our skies. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm curious. Uh, there's of course many different theories as to what these things are, why they're here. Um, what, what theories do you lean towards or is it all of the above? 
Well, you know, I'll tell you this. I asked Jacques Vallée that last year. Uh, I said, you know, you've always kind of been of the mind that these things aren't ET. And now you're, you know, of course, you'd written a book about uh, this alleged crash uh, in 1945, um, which uh, the book, of course, is called Trinity. And I asked him, are you moving more in the direction of the idea that this is now extraterrestrials? And I'll say for the record here, with all respect to Jacques Vallée, that I too have some, you know, suspicions about the Trinity case. There were some articles written by another colleague of mine, Douglas Dean Johnson, recently that outlined a lot of that issue with that. But my point had just been, you know, Jacques, are you now looking at this from a different perspective? I mean, which is it? Is it is it time travelers or is it interdimensionals or something more anomalous? Or is this just extraterrestrial buddies dropping down and occasionally crashing? Jacques' response was, it's all one thing. And for him, what he was saying is not that it's all like there's one grand unified theory of the paranormal. He's saying when we study UAP, we don't say, well, I mean, maybe you could you say you're a specialist. I only deal with the apparent time travel cases or I only deal with the apparent interdimensional cases. Jacques saying when we talk about unidentified aerial phenomena, we don't really know what it is. But even Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick of Arrow has recently said during an ABC News interview, uh, first, the misconception is that these are all one thing and that all of them are extraterrestrial. He says neither of those statements are true. Um, these are phenomena, and there are a variety of different things we observe that we call UAP. And there is a possibility some could be extraterrestrial. Dr. Kirkpatrick has never denied that possibility. But he also maintains that there's no proof of that. Now, David Grush, on the other hand, of course, with his claims recently, has come forward and said, yeah, what has been explained to me by the officials I've spoken to is that they believe that this non-human uh, non -human intelligence or NHI, uh, it's real. Uh, and asked during the hearing, well, but why don't you just say extraterrestrial, Dave? He says, I prefer non-human intelligence just because that doesn't ascribe any agency to this. We don't know really where this is coming from, but it seems evident that there is an intelligence in our midst that we can't account for. So in terms of where I sit on that, right, what do I think these things are? I know it frustrates people. I've been called a fence sitter, Jeff, but uh, but for me, the... Uh, it's important if you're going to look at this scientifically not to lead with presumptions. And as soon as you start saying, well, I don't know, but I'm just going to say I think it's this. It's fine to do that as a hypothesis, right? It's fine to say, here is my theory, and I'm now going to test that theory. My theory is that these are the more scientific hypothesis would actually be my theory is that UFOs are not extraterrestrial. And then I'd have to try and disprove that hypothesis. Because a lot of people forget that in science, there's a necessity for having a test for falsehood. So. You don't want to set yourself up for failure. You'd do that if you were saying, well, I believe these things are extraterrestrial. Now disprove it. You really can't. <laughs> that is the thing. You might have a better job or better time, uh, at, least, at least more uh, success, disproving that hypothesis. In other words, saying, okay, I have found no proof that aliens are not extraterrestrial. And therefore, let's look at what the evidence seems to represent. But I'm open to that possibility. So all that said... I try to think scientifically without leading with presumptions and making assumptions that I can't back up. But based on the evidence that I've seen, what it seems to me is most likely is that some UAP, the more extraordinary instances, are probably not a technology of ours of Earth. And if I were to characterize that and give it a name, I'd probably do like what David Grush did and say, I'd, I'll go with non-human intelligence for now, but I'm very open to the possibility, pending further evidence, that, yeah, we have been seeing extraterrestrial visitation. And the last thing I'll just add to that is that there is some anecdotal evidence in the form of uh, eyewitness accounts that is suggestive of that. There's this weird issue people take with talking about encounters with the occupants of UAP and sightings of those mostly humanoid occupants. In my view, and some don't deem this to be credible, but frankly, I think it's because they haven't studied the history to the depth that I do and that I have. There are some reports, very credible reports of the occupants of UAP. Uh, you know, I can give you examples, 1964, Lonnie Zamora in New, at uh, Socorro, New Mexico, um, the Hickson Parker abduction to me in, the, in 1973 at Pascagoula, Mississippi is also very interesting. Um, there are a lot of instances where the, ob the objects are not all that's seen. There are also occupants. And yet there's this insane attitude that people have that, well, we don't talk about those cases. We don't ever address the humanoids. 
I think we're doing ourselves a great disservice. And if we fail to look at some of the data just because it seems extraordinary, it's probably only only going to hinder us from understanding in the full context what this phenomena represents. But those cases to me do point to the idea not only of an, a, an intelligence that doesn't appear to be ours, human, but maybe that we're looking at something, maybe it's autonomous AI, you know, it may not be biologics as Fravor, or I'm sorry, as David Grush said, but in any case, it doesn't appear to be something we made. Now, one other possibility, though, that I have entertained in the past is that in the wide range of different things UAP might be, some might be what I was describing there, maybe extraterrestrial non-human intelligence, either mechanical or biological or some combination. But I'm also open to the idea that we could be looking at something that's atemporal, you know, the idea of time travel. Some people are like, look, man, getting from point A to point B, yeah, but time travel, don't give me that mess. That's impossible. Well, Again, you're only thinking, you know, three-dimensionally, Marty, because if you if you if you assume that it far enough in the future, humans or any other intelligence is able to harness time and to use it and to bend it and to shape it such that they can travel through it, it doesn't have to be us doing that. But if at any time in the future any intelligence becomes capable of doing that, that option would be on the table too. So it could even be some weird combination of time travelers. And extraterrestrials, right? You know what I'm so, <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I'm open to all those possibilities. But if I lean toward one, I would have to say that clearly there seems to be a non-human intelligent component in some of those cases based on those witness testimonies. Yeah, yeah, agreed. agreed. I know I've rattled on. That was a very lengthy answer, but it's it's a complex issue. So. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, this has been a really fun conversation, Micah. Um, can you? Tell my listeners the best place to find you on the internet. Absolutely. Yeah. MicahHanks.com is my personal website. Uh, and of course, I also am editor in chief at The Debrief, which is just the debrief.org. Uh, of course, all our news is made available right there and free to the public where they can read all about this. And you can go read the story that brought David Grush's claims to the public for the first time on uh, June 5th by Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Kane. Excellent reporting that they did for us. And of course, a lot of recent uh, congressional coverage. In fact, Tim McMillan and I are right now at this very moment working on another follow-up piece that people can look forward to in the days ahead. You heard that here first in Strangeology, so there's a little exclusive for you. Um, but last thing too, I'll say, Jeff, uh, you know, I, I would like to invite people out there listening. If you are an experiencer, if you have observed this phenomenon if you've observed any kind of phenomena that you think is relevant to the UAP question, especially, but I, I do dabble in a variety of different areas of the strangeness, um, I would I would invite people to write uh, to me and you can reach me directly at info at micahanks.com. That's my email address. I'm working on putting together a formal reporting system for people to uh, submit that kind of information to me through secure channels if necessary. Uh, because I think it's become incumbent upon us as researchers to do more of that. I, I heard Ryan Graves during the testimony he gave the other day talking about pilots feeling they don't have a place to go with this. Now, many have been going to the aforementioned NARCAP organization for years and National UFO Reporting Center as well. But we need to be collecting more data so that we can understand this phenomenon. And so if you have had an experience, please info at micahanks.com. I'd like to hear from people out there in your listenership, too. Great. Thanks. Well, thanks for, again for coming on to the show today, Micah. Um, members, please stick around after this short break for Strangeology Beyond. And for everyone else, we'll catch you next time. Thanks again to Micah for coming on the show today. The future is going to be very interesting indeed in the world of UFOs and unidentified aerial or anomalous phenomena. And it's just a weird time to be alive. And something like this isn't anything I ever thought we'd be seeing in our lifetimes. And I know that there is this general sentiment out there, this kind of apathy or the government said, UFOs are real, so it must be a PSYOP, and I don't believe it, or it's something like Project Blue Beam. You know, who knows? Maybe it's all of the above, maybe it's nothing at all, or maybe there is really something going on here that's been going on for a long, long time. Time will tell. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the show today, and we're definitely going to be having Micah back on again in the future, so stay tuned. 
As always, a huge thank you to everyone out there who checks out my show. Those of you who download it, share it with your friends and family. It helps me out so much when you do that. We're streaming in well over 50 countries now, which is wild. So thank you so much. And the show seems to be on track for starting to push something like a half million downloads by the end of the year, which it's blowing my mind at least. <laughs> so I super appreciate all the support. And for those of you who have been here with me since the beginning, those who have joined along the way, and for all new listeners out there, thank you for tuning in and checking it out. The Strangeology podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of listeners like you. If you're interested in advertising on the Strangeology podcast or would like to collaborate, please send all business inquiries to info at strangeology.com. Alternatively, you can head on over to strangeology.com and go to my contact page and fill out the forms there. Listeners, I would love to hear your stories and encounters with things like cryptids, UFOs, ghosts, the paranormal, strange and unexplained. This is a call for new listener stories. So if you have a story that you'd like to share with my podcast, either in writing or voicemail, or if you'd like to come onto the show for an interview, let's get in touch. You can email me at info at strangeology.com again, or fill out the form on my contact page on my website. I also have a voicemail that you can call. The number is 802-448-0612. Again, that's 802-448-0612. The voicemail, I believe, has a two to three minute time limit. So if your story goes on longer than that, hang up, call back, and leave another message. We can always splice things together and work work it out from there. I'm hoping to try to find a different method, perhaps to get longer messages recorded all at once. Perhaps that's in the form of interviews or something like that. But I look forward to hearing from you. If you have a story, definitely send it my way. And if you haven't done so yet, make sure to give me a follow over on all my social media accounts for daily updates, memes, and other content. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, Threads, and the app formerly known as Twitter. I'm most active posting short form video content on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. So if you're looking for more content from me, definitely check that out. A lot of it is I pick a certain topic or cryptid conspiracy theory and make a short video with some visual graphics. Super fun. People seem to enjoy it. Gets a lot of interesting comments and engagement. So check it out. Links will be in the show notes. And if you're looking for another way to support Strangeology, I have a whole merch line. If you didn't know, you can find my Etsy shop at strangeology.etsy.com, where I have a whole assortment of cryptid, alien and Fortean gear, which is available on T-shirts, hoodies, tank tops, long sleeves. I also have stickers, magnets, prints, hats, mugs, blankets, enamel pins and more. I do all my own designs and I'm always trying to come up with new ideas, new designs, as well as different types of merch as often as I'm able to add to the store. Again, that's strangeology.etsy.com. Links will be in the show notes, of course. All right, I think that's all for me for now. I'm gonna take a quick break here. Micah had a few extra minutes to spare for Strangeology Beyond, the members only portion of the show to discuss his work into ancient archeological mysteries. It was a really fascinating conversation, so you won't want to miss it. Patrons, stick with me, and for everyone else, until the next time, take care of yourselves and each other, and keep it strange.
right, welcome back to Strangeology Beyond for all you members for this exclusive segment of the show. Thanks again, Micah, for hanging out for a little while longer. You're a very busy man. You got a lot going on, especially.